I was listening to All Things Considered today, and there was a report about an attorney who was near death uh, on a hunger strike. I, I'm sure a number of you would know his name. Um, in, in any case, he, um, he was, he's been in prison without charges for nearly six months. And in the conversation, in the news report, um, they mentioned this as, if it, as something that's just normal. Um, they, they said at the end that some arrangement had been work, worked out and that to save face for everyone, which is a pretty astonishing, pretty astonishing language for a situation where peop, uh, the people uh, who are targeted by such char uh, non-charges and, and jailed are living under essentially a military dictatorship. But that goes without comment. I'm, I'm so pleased that we have uh, tonight uh, Ajamo De La Hunt Jr. and Rania Masri, uh, for whom these matters are, are not uh, just um, normal and who are very capable in discussing what some of our options can be uh, as popular movements come together uh, to work in strength across lines that uh, sometimes divide us. So, uh, Ajama, will you come forward, please, and uh, please tell us about your work and about the struggles right now. Good evening. I am very honored to be here today to speak on black and Palestinian solidarity. I first became conscious of the occupation my junior year in high school after the bombing of Gaza. My grandparents then later explained to me the history behind the occupation and Zionism. The Youth Organizing Institute's Freedom Summer School also informed me about the Israeli occupation. However, when I was in middle school, my granddad had taken a picture of me and my great grandfather at a Palestinian solidarity rally in Durham. That kind of gave me a time frame of how long these atrocities have been occurring. I met Rangia in Raleigh at a Palestinian, Palestinian solidarity rally where she gave me my first kafia and told me how the struggles of African Americans and Palestinians are very similar. Later on that year, I was able to hear her speak in Raleigh where she expanded on the connection between black people and Palestinians. I began to look more into it and saw the major role the United States plays in the occupation while remembering their role in the war on black America. I say the names Rakia Boyd, Rakia Boyd, Chantel Davis, Say name. Chantel Davis, Say name. Mike Brown, Say name. Mike Brown, Say name. Oscar Grant. Say name. Those are all victims of police and vigilante violence. After the murder of Trayvon Martin, the Black Lives Matter movement emerged, started by three black women. The movement soon became a resistance movement, not only to police violence, but fighting back against any form of anti-blackness. It is essential to have a full and clear understanding of what it means when we say black lives matter. It means we want to be free. We want to live without the baleness of white supremacy and police violence. We want to end to the school to prison pipeline and mass incarceration. We want to end to transphobia and homophobia. We want to end to sexism. Ultimately, we want self-determination. We want to be liberated. We want freedom and we will get it by any means necessary. One of the most amazing aspects of the Black Lives Matter movement is its commitment to ensuring all black lives matter. It is important to understand we are not free until we are all free. Last month, over 1,500 black activists gathered at Cleveland State University for the Movement for Black Lives National Conference. It was essential that it be restricted to only black people. We needed time to, stri we needed time to strategize, heal, love each other, and figure out how to respond to this racist system. The current atrocities facing our people is a corroboration that there is a war on black America. In response to the war, there's significant need of rebuilding the black liberation movement. This was a perfect start. There was a large variety of workshops such as Black Trans Lives Matter, Building a Security Team, 60th Anniversary of Emmett Till's Murder, Centering Black Women and Trans People in the Movement, U.S. Political Prisoners, Jackson Rising, Community Control Over Police, Members of the Black Panther Party, and many more. Although attendees were provided so many outstanding workshops, workshops, half the time folks were in the quad for a mini cipher, drumming and dancing. I mean, you could tell how much this conference was needed. Organizer chant, I love being black. I love being black. 
It was also a time period where people were able to connect on a national and international level. Historically, police have brutalized and terrorized our communities, and they continue those unjust acts of violence today. It is mind-blowing to know the same officers a person in our communities could be the same officers in our schools targeting youth of color and send them down the path of the school to prison pipeline. We need counselors, not cops. Solutions, not suspensions. As Chris Rock said, all those good cops y'all bring up when you say not all cops are bad seem to never be around when their comrades are killing innocent people. Therefore, it is time to really start protecting ourselves and defending our own communities. Organized security teams, armed and unarmed, to guard, monitor all of our religious, social, political, education institutions, neighborhoods, and homes. Develop strategies to assist our people on how to deal with law enforcement when rights are being violated. Develop campaigns against racism, terrorism, and create immediate response teams. Furthermore, the police state in America is deeply connected to the struggles in Palestine. Many police departments in the U.S. go to Israel to train with the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. The IDF, brutal, the IDF brutally beats and terrorizes the people of Palestine, same as the police force do to black people in this country. That is another reason why black people should stand with Palestine. In the fight to overcome oppression, we must look at our allies in the struggle. The fight, the fight expands from a civil rights issue to a human rights issue. As, as we remember the violence that this country has put African descendants through, from the enslavement, Jim Crow, the war on drugs, and mass incarceration, we must realize how our struggles are corresponding to other oppressed people, such as our brothers and sisters in Palestine who are resisting the Israeli occupation that kills thousands of Palestinians. We see the state of Israel reinforcing these inhumane acts of segregation and taking land from indigenous people, restricting Palestinians from going down certain roads, not giving them the access to certain buildings, and starving the occupied West Bank with poverty and lack of resources. There's been, a solidarity, there's been solidarity between black Africans and African descendant people and Palestinians. The PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, showed a great deal of support to Nelson Mandela and the anti-apartheid South Africa movement. They also have also been supportive to the black liberation movement and those movements returned that support. The US government funds over $3 million to the Israeli occupation with our tax dollars and fully understands the racist tactics by the Israeli government, but yet they still fund them. As the United States and Israel continue committing acts of genocide, it is essential we have a resistance movement. As allies in the Palestinian fight for freedom, we must enforce, enforce the BDS movement, which stands for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Boycott ranges from a lot of things, such as food and other items, but I really want to focus on academic boycotts. Many college campuses across the country welcome IDF soldiers to come speak on their campuses. We must hold these education institutions accountable as students, and as students not allow them to be there without a disruption. Another form of resistance in the Black Lives Matter movement is holding presidential candidates accountable. No more business as usual. I want to refer to the Black Lives Matter statement on political affiliation. In the year leading up to the elections, we are committed to holding all candidates for office accountable to the needs and dreams of black people. We embrace a diversity of tactics. So therefore, the tactics used on Bernie Sanders were effective. It really made him put racial justice as one of his major points. Furthermore, the statement made other excellent points. Historically, all political parties have participated in systematic disenfranchisement of black people. Anti-black racism, especially the sanctioned by the state, has resulted in the loss of healthy and thriving black life and well-being. An outstanding source to understand black solidarity in Palestine is by reading the Black Activist Statement of Palestine signed by Angela Davis, Cornel West, Talib Kweli, the Dream Defenders, Organization for Black Struggle, and Hands Up United, and Black Works for Justice, and hundreds of other states. Our support extends to those living under occupation and siege, Palestinian citizens in Israel, and the five million Palestinian refugees exiled in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine. The refugees' right to return to their homeland in present-day Israel is the most important aspect of justice for Palestine. Palestinian liberation represents an inherent threat to Zionist state of Israel, a colonial state built on ethnic cleansing, land theft, and denial of Palestinian humanity and sovereignty. While we acknowledge that the apartheid configuration in Israel and Palestine is distinct from what took place in the United States and South Africa, we continue to see connections between the situation of Palestinians and black people. We offer this statement first and foremost to Palestinians whose suffering does not go unnoticed, whose resistance and resilience under racism and colonialism inspires us. It is to Palestinians as we, as well as the Israel and U.S. government, that we declare our commitment to working through cultural, economic, and political means to ensure Palestinian liberation at the same time as we work towards our own. As we resist, I want to remember the late Julian Bond. He said, good things don't come to those who wait, they come to those who agitate. So as we resist, let's remember to agitate and not wait. 
Black folks and Palestinians both want self-determination, want the right to own our land, own our stores, and the end to colonialism, white supremacy, and racist governments. We want to be free, and we will get free by any means necessary. Thank you. such a thrill to, to be here, and I feel so old, a jamura, just to hear you speak. Anyway, I'm, I feel like a, a very proud aunt. Thank you again. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really honored just to be back home, to be with my friends and to be with my comrades. The more I learned, you know, I, I lived in the U.S. for some 20 years, and the more I learned of racism in this country in the years that I was living here, and the more I learned of racism in this country in the years that I wasn't living here, both past and present, the more this country reminded me of Israel, up front. I found white supremacy and Zionism to be an honest marriage of values, more like any other marriage that I know, white supremacy and Zionism. There's a lot of things that white supremacists and Zionists want us to do. First and foremost, they want us to forget. They want us to forget. So every time they kill us again, we treat it as if it's an isolated event or as if it's simply an accident, as if it's a bad apple in a tree, it's a mistake, it's somehow it happened. That's how they want us to look at every single event, as isolated. They want it to be decontextualized. Therefore, one of the foundations for our resistance becomes the knowledge of our history. The knowledge of our history becomes act of resistance. We're marking this month the one-year anniversary of the killing of another unarmed black teenager in this country. We're also marking another anniversary, the one-year anniversary of yet another genocidal attack against Palestinians. And there's numerous anniversaries and numerous attacks. When I spoke about the murder of Mike Brown um, in Lebanon in the Shatila refugee camp, and all I told them was there was a young man who just graduated high school who was on his way to see his grandmother when he was shot with numerous bullets and left to bleed for four hours in the street. And they all looked at me and they told me, was this in Ramallah, in Gaza? And I said, no, it was in the US. The connection was significant. And yet the media treated the murder of Mike Brown as if it was a new event. In 2012, the Malcolm X grassroots movement issued its first report on what they called, and I quote, the extrajudicial killing of black people in the United States. They said every 36 hours, the police or security guards or self-appointed vigilantes kill a black person in this country. Every 36 hours. One year later, they had to issue a correction. It was no longer every 36 hours. Now it has become every 28 hours. Every 28 hours, Mike Brown's murder was not the first. SL Ford, John Crawford, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Tarika Wilson, Malcolm Ferguson, Renisha McBride, Amadou Diallo, Yvette Smith, Oscar Grant, Sean Bell, Katherine Johnston, Rakia Boyd, and literally hundreds upon hundreds of others nor has the killing of Mike Brown been the last. Since August of last year, in one year, the police in this country have killed 1,083 Americans, an average of three a day. And while the majority of these people that have been killed by the police are white, there is a three times likelihood that an African American is shot by the police than there is a likelihood that a white man or white woman is shot by the police. So what we see is no isolated event, and what we see is insane impunity. Of these 1,000 plus killings, only 22 cases have been found where officers were indicted or charged. 22. So we have no isolation, and we have impunity. And they want us to forget. A few
few weeks ago, there was another crime, very horrific, that made the news that I'm sure is very familiar to African Americans in this country. A home was burned down. We had three people, vigilantes is what they considered themselves to be, who threw a Molotov cocktail into a home. The first to be killed was that 18-month-old boy, Ali Saad the Wabsha. His four-year-old brother, Ahmed, is still in the hospital. His mother, Riham, is still in the hospital. But his father, Saad, also died a few days later. And the media looked at this event as if it were an isolated event. But it wasn't an isolated event, because a year earlier, those same non-state actors, self-appointed vigilantes, kidnapped a teenager beat him up, forced him to drink gasoline, and burned him from the inside out, 16-year-old Muhammad Abu Khadir. Since then, the defendants, so-called so defendants, have been apprehended, they have confessed to the crime, they have reenacted the crime, and there has not been a conviction. They have not been convicted one year later. Was that new? No. 19 years earlier, we remember, there was another settler, all of these non-state actors, also going hunting for children, who kidnapped an 11-year-old, Helmi Shusha, 11-year-old, he beat him to death. He was first acquitted. And then he was retried and sentenced this time to $11,000 the fine for kidnapping and beating a child was $11,000. There's no jail time. Now compare it to something else that happened around that same time. A Palestinian man had consensual sex with a Jewish-Israeli woman because he did not tell her that he was not a Jew before they had sex. She took him to court for rape and he was sentenced to 18 months in jail. Get a sense here of the difference that we're talking about. There is most definitely state impunity to these crimes against Palestinians. And in addition to there being open impunity to these crimes, there has been an increase in the crimes themselves. We know of churches that are still being burned down, but now it's no longer news. We know if this is still happening in this country. Since 2006, there have been more than 2,000 settler attacks against Palestinians. In 2013, in one year, there were 399. In this year alone, there have been more than 120 attacks. And the number is increasing. Of those that were investigated between 2005 and 2013, 90% of the investigations received no convictions no indictments. So again, we see impunity. It's not just settler violence, though. And when Benjamin Netanyahu had the audacity, the evil banality of calling the murder of Ali Saad the Wabshi to be a terrorist act, you know, I was appalled because this is coming from the man who himself has killed children. We could do without his hypocrisy. But yet, during that same time, there have been other state killings. A few days ago, Muhammad Bassam Atrash from Jenin was shot eight times by a soldier in the chest at a distance of five meters. Shot eight times. Earlier that week, Ahmed Al Masri, 17 year old, was killed in Gaza. And the same day, Layth Al Khaldi, 17 year old, was killed in Ramallah. This is state violence. Since 13 years, for the past 13 years, one Palestinian child has been killed by state violence every three days. One child killed every three days for the past 13 years. We have state violence, we have impunity, and it's ongoing. Human Rights Watch tells us that the Israeli forces regularly detain, I prefer to use the more honest word of kidnap, Palestinian children, place them in chokeholds, beat them, strip search them, and issue forced confessions from them, and place them in solitary confinement. 
This is regular. Last year, Malak al Khatib, a 14 year old girl, was kidnapped near her village in Benin. Israeli soldiers kicked her, they stepped on her neck, they beat her unconscious, they threatened to harm her family if she did not confess to the crime of throwing rocks. She confessed. She spent 64 days in Israeli detention. Now the Israeli Knesset has passed a law that children, Palestinian children, who are convicted of throwing stones at the illegal occupying soldiers, which by the way is their legal right to do, to throw stones and to use any means necessary to liberate themselves, they will face 20 years in jail. So we have state violence and impunity, and we have a history of this. And of course, we cannot forget what happened last year. The US supported Israeli butchery of Palestinians in Gaza over a period of 51 days, where in one day alone, on the 1st of August, between 135 to 200 Palestinians were killed in one day alone. 75 children were killed in one day. There were so many people killed. The morgues were filled to such a capacity that small children, the corpses of small children, were stored in vegetable refrigerators and ice cream coolers. Did any of these soldiers get convicted? Was there any level of indictments? Yes. Three Israeli soldiers who participated in the 51-day slaughter have been indicted by Israeli military prosecutors for looting for looting. The Israeli military investigation ruled that the war against the Palestinians in Gaza was, and I quote, proportionate. It was proportionate. And now the media is not talking about Gaza anymore because the Israelis declared that there's a ceasefire. Has there been a ceasefire? Since last year, the Israeli military and naval forces have fired into Gaza and on Palestinian fishermen at least 740 times. Fishermen are fired on within the six nautical miles of the Gaza shores more than once a day on average. 23 airstrikes have been carried out on Gaza in recent months, and Israeli military vehicles have had more than 23 incursions, otherwise known as invasions, into Gaza just in the past few months. There has been no ceasefire. But of course, a ceasefire is defined as Palestinians dying quietly. That's how they define a ceasefire. Nor has the siege been lifted. For the first time, we have infant mortality rates that have increased rather than decreased. Infant mortality rates in Gaza have increased for the first time in 50 years. And of the more than 12,000 homes that were completely destroyed by US-funded weaponry, not one has been rebuilt. Not one has been rebuilt. At the rate of this alleged rebuilding, where we have 1% of the materials that is needed to rebuild Gaza is actually entering Gaza, it will take 76 years to rebuild the homes and the schools. This is Zionism. This is racism. This is colonialism. This is the marriage of white supremacy and Zionism. And yet, there is a history to this. Just like Angela Davis told us that, I quote, there was an unbroken line of police violence in the United States that takes us all the way back to the days of slavery, the aftermath of slavery, and the development of the KKK. The same applies when we look at our struggle for liberation in Palestine. Other historians, including Tanahisi Coates, have reminded us, and I quote, after having been enslaved for 250 years, black people were then terrorized. In the Deep South, a second slavery emerged. In the North, legislatures, mayors, civic associations, banks, and citizens all colluded to put black people into ghettos where they were overcrowded, overcharged, and undereducated. We see this ongoing for us to recognize police brutality in this country means we have to recognize the history of police brutality. The killing of Mike Brown was not the exception, the same applies in Palestine. Where do we start when we talk about Gaza? All too often, people talk about the last three wars. The last three wars. As if before the last three wars, life was peachy. But no. Do we start in 1993 then, 
when Gaza was first fenced off before the building of the apartheid wall in the West Bank, when it was first fenced off? Do we start in 1993 with the destructive, irrational Oslo Accords? Or do we start even earlier, in 1967, when the occupation began to prevent any possibility of industrial development? No. We start at the very least in 1948. We start in 1948 when the Israeli colonialism and genocide and ethnic cleansing created out of the Gaza Strip this tiny sliver of Palestine that constitutes 1.3% of Palestine, where they created out of Gaza the temporary shelter for refugees from more than 247 villages. More than 247 villages were destroyed and their inhabitants had to flee as refugees to Gaza in 48. And since 1948, Israel has launched 12 wars against the Palestinians in Gaza. 12 wars. From the very first war in 1948, a hospital in Gaza was destroyed, and market shelters were destroyed, and 200 people were killed in 1948 in what the Red Cross described in Isaac, quote, a scene of horror. There was another war that began in 1951 that lasted for seven years, in which Israeli brutality in Gaza was much more systematic than it was in the West Bank, in Syria, or in Lebanon. There was a third war that began in 1956, in which Israeli soldiers invaded Khan Yunis, they collected all males between the ages of 15 and 50. They took them from their homes and they shot them. 520 people were killed. The following week, another massacre. Between that time period, 1,230 people were killed out of a population of 300,000. With the exception of this latest war on the Palestinians in Gaza, that war was the bloodiest. There was a fourth war in 67, a fifth war in 71, a sixth war, a seventh war, an eighth war, a ninth war, 10th war, 11th war, 12th war. The question only becomes, when will the next war against the Palestinians in Gaza be? Because state violence, a history of ongoing state violence, this level of impunity means that it will continue to increase. That is what we are facing, a continual increase of violence. There has been a full normalization of racism in Israel. This is a poll taken in 2012, where Jewish Israelis were asked about their opinion on the separation of Israelis and Palestinians in the West Bank road systems. 74% approved it. Separation by road systems is another form of apartheid. More than 69% said if Israel annexes officially the West Bank, that the Palestinians living in the West Bank should not get the right to vote. And almost half of those polled support the transfer of Palestinians with Israeli citizenships, which means ethnic cleansing. This was in 2012. Since then, racism has increased. Joel Benin has a, an amazing article he published last year in which he documents specifically how racism has become a legitimate and integral component of Israeli public culture. Israeli public culture. Why has there been so much racism? Because just like in the United States, they need to justify the violence. And racism serves as a powerful tool to justify the violence. And why is there so much violence against Palestinians? Because we exist. Our crime is that we exist. And any attempt to paint Palestinian actions as criminal, therefore as justifying the response by Israelis, is akin in my eyes to saying he should not have been wearing a hoodie, he should not have been eating Skittles, he was walking home too late at night, he should not have talked back to the policeman, he should have been polite. All of these things that I hear on a regular basis and unfortunately from way too many members of my own community as a means to accept or understand police brutality against people of color in this country. No. Israeli policies toward Palestinians are built on something very simple. 
They want to get a maximum amount of Palestinian land with the minimum amount of Palestinian people, and they want to put a maximum number of Palestinian people on the minimum amount of land. And for Americans, this should be very familiar because the history of this country was built on the very same concept against the indigenous peoples of this country and the First Nation people of this country. The Europeans, when they came to the Americas, did the exact same thing to the indigenous First Nations of the Americas. The exact same thing. I see a marriage of values that is historic. But what has happened in Israel lately is different than what's happening in the US. With the exception of Donald Trump and a few members of the Republican Party, just verbally, the Israelis are being more honest. I'm not saying the Democrats are any better, mind you. I'm just saying that some Republicans are just being honest. This is the Israeli new government. Rabbi Eli Ben-Dahan, deputy defense minister, called Palestinians animals and said Jews always have higher souls than non-Jews, even if the Jews are gay. The minister for education, Naftali Bennett, supports transferring Palestinians from the West Bank and otherwise ethnic cleansing. And he said, and I quote, I've killed many Arabs in my life. There's no problem with that. Eilat Shakir, of all the people, the justice minister of Israel, very clearly said that Palestinian mothers should be killed because our children are, quote, snakes. And then you have the minister of sport and culture, Miri Rejav, who said during violent anti-African riots in Tel Aviv that those Sudanese are a cancer in our body and I apologize, I did not intend to offend cancer patients. It is impossible to have a society that justifies this level of violence by allowing racism against one community, Palestinians, and not have that racism seep into other communities. It is impossible for Zionism not to be racist against all peoples. It's impossible because they justify racism against one community. And we see it with the level of anti-African sentiment that is erupting from the Israeli government and from Israeli media. But again, we need to recognize that this level of racism is not new it's only honest now. It's only public. It's like Donald Trump's statements, only openly stated, not anything new. And racism has many forms. We're either invisible, such as in this picture. We're not even seen by the photographer. You don't even see the Palestinian being harassed on his own land by someone probably from Brooklyn. Not only are we invisible, but our murder is celebrated. These are t-shirts that are increasing in popularity throughout Israel. The first one on the far left has a picture of a pregnant Palestinian mother, one shot, two kills. The one on the far right shows a child in the crosshairs. Death to Arabs has become the new chant that is not limited to the Israeli army. Last year there were open calls in Israeli papers to justify ethnic cleansing and to justify genocide. They were publishing articles justifying genocide against Palestinians. I thank them for their honesty personally. But this is the level that we've reached in today. Jerry Marketus talked about Muhammad Allan. A few days ago, there was a solidarity protest for Palestinian hunger striker, lawyer Muhammad Allan. Allan is being held in a medical center in Ashkelon. He was put on life support on Friday when he fell unconscious after 59 days of hunger strike in protest of administrative detention. Don't you love these words? Administrative detention. Administrative detention which the Israeli Minister of Justice said should not be applied against Israeli citizens. Administrative detention means the Israeli government has the legal right to apprehend a Palestinian, put him in jail for six months without charge, without trial, and continue to renew the six-month detention. In other words, indefinite imprisonment, without charge, without trial. We have 401 administrative detainees held without charge, 
without trial. A few days ago, the Israeli government announced it would release Alan if he agreed to be deported for four years, deported from his own land without charge, without trial. He responded by saying, administrative detention is a return to slavery and the slave, and thus I refuse to be a slave at any point. The truth is that I now savor hunger as long as the goal is freedom. And so I have found myself having to fight this battle, and he fought the battle. And early this morning, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled that he will be released because his deteriorating health is no longer, means that he no longer poses a threat to Israeli security. But it means something different to us. It means that he has won. It means that freedom has won. But two days ago, there was a protest where people in solidarity have been protesting outside his hospital. And then there were some right-wingers protesting also. And their protests include, why in Gaza is there no studying? Because there are no more children. In Gaza, this was their chant. Why is there no studying in Gaza? Because there are no children left there. In other words, you have them openly celebrating the slaughter of children. There were police there that apprehended and wounded and detained Palestinians and left these monsters protesting. And lest we think it's only against Arabs, they also said, forgive my language, fuck the media, death to the reporters. This has been ongoing. And it reminded me of a scene in Ferguson. The Oath Keepers being able to walk, open arms, open weaponry, while the same news media would say, you know that other black man that was killed by the cops? He was carrying a gun. And you go, but there's a whole militia of white folks carrying guns. No, 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 but the black guy was carrying a gun. Same paper, not recognizing that there is a problem with this language, and it makes me really miss the Black Panthers. The racism that we see here, we also see in US policies, and we have to remember this. A postcard was made, postcards were made in this country so that people could take pictures along with the lynching of children, postcards. So why would we then be surprised when other pictures were taken of other Americans along with the victims of their torture? The first two black and white pictures are postcards that were sold in this country to celebrate the lynching of black children. And that is a picture that was taken of the Abu Ghraib detention facility in occupied Iraq by US soldiers. We see this racism in US policies. How could we have racism domestically and not have it in our foreign policy? It's impossible. And how could we not have these same images from IDF t-shirts, how could we not also see them here, where mugshots of non-convicted individuals are used as target practice by the police department? What does that do? Both of these images serve the same purpose to dehumanize the other, to make his killing or her killing easier. We see it. And of course, we cannot forget the critical role that Hollywood plays here. Hollywood is no innocent liberal institution. American Sniper. These were tweets in response to Rani Khaliq, a journalist who criticized the movie as it should be, as it should be criticized. These are what people said. Again, forgive my language. Great fucking movie, now I really want to kill some fucking ragheads. American Sniper makes me, want to go wait, makes me want to go shoot some fucking Arabs. Arabs are portrayed for who they are, vermin scum. How could we not see this? Where is it taking us? And of course, how can I not talk about UNC and the killing of three Palestinian Muslims in their home? This is exactly how we are viewed by the media and the police in this country. If you're Arab, if you're Muslim, you're automatically a terrorist. If you're black, you're a thug. But if you happen to be of the majority of the serial killers in this country who are white, 
You're mentally unstable, and we might take you out to Burger King for some hamburgers before we take you to the police station. So we have issues. And yes, yes, whenever I talk about the similarities in our struggle, I always have somebody standing up and saying, but we're not identical. And there's no occupation in the United States. And I'm not saying that African Americans in this country are facing occupation the way that Palestinians are. No, the struggles are not identical. No, we are not oppressed in the very same way. But the legacies of slavery and colonial dispossession, however vile, are not interchangeable. But nevertheless, there remains a critical marriage of values between white supremacy and Zionism. And this marriage of values is not only shown in the narrative, it's also shown in the training. Exactly what Ajamu talked about, we have 175 senior US law enforcement officials from 100 different agencies in this country that get their training in Israel. And the Anti-Defamation League, when they honored, just a few, a few weeks ago, they honored the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. And when they were criticized by Jewish Voice for Peace, they blamed the victim. Police brutality must be caused by the victim, not by the police. And they're proud, and according to their website, they're proud that these law enforcement officials are taking the lessons they learned in Israel back to the United States. God help this country. In one week, three people were killed one was shot repeatedly on the roof of his home. A father was shot inside his home while he was trying to protect his sons. And another 21-year-old was shot and killed in the streets. It could be St. Louis. It could be Chicago. It just happened this time to be the West Bank. Every 28 hours in the US. But it doesn't stop there, because not only are they getting training, they're getting material support. A few months after the murder of Mike Brown, St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department added an Israeli weapon to their arsenal, the skunk spray. The skunk spray may sound like, oh, you smell bad. OK, it's not that. This is high pressure released from a water cannon, a canister, or a grenade that emits an odor that smells like rotting animal carcass, plus raw sewage, plus human excrement. And this odor sticks to the walls, to your clothes, to your skin, for weeks. And it can only be washed off with a special soap that's only accessible to the people that are spraying it on you. One person said, the water lingers on your skin to a point where you want to rip your skin off. It has been deployed against Palestinians since 2008. Deployed against entire neighborhoods, sprayed into homes, into schools, against funerals. And now it's coming to the United States. It's coming to the United States. The US police define it as ideal for controlling crowds, ideal for border crossings, for correctional facilities, for demonstrations. And it's so ideal for demonstrations because, according to the police in this country, if they spray you with this stuff, they don't have to apprehend you then. They can apprehend you a few days later. They'll follow the scent. It's being advertised because it's been field tested for years against Palestinians. We don't know how many other police departments in this country are now getting this spray. But expect it to get more widespread. But we also have to be critical, because there have been others in this country that are being killed by the police that rarely make the news. And we, who have been used to our lives being disposable, need to be more vigilant against other people's lives being disposable. One week before the death of Sandra Bland, Sandra Bland, whom you all know, who died in custody in Texas, one week before she died, this woman died, Sarah Lee Circle Bear, 24-year-old pregnant mother of two of the Lakota tribe, apprehended in South Dakota, traffic violation, had been begging the officers for help. They told her she was faking it. She died in jail. A few days earlier, Rexdale Henry, a member of the Choctaw Tribal Council, 
also arrested for failure to pay a traffic fine, was found dead in a Mississippi jail cell. We don't hear about police brutality against Native Americans, even though Native Americans in this country are the community that is most likely to be killed by police in this country, most likely to be killed. Another lesser known truth that we have to be vigilant about is what is happening on the border with Mexico. What is happening with the militarization of the Texas, Arizona, Mexico border. And I cannot talk about that border without remembering Henry David Thoreau and the fact that Texas and Arizona and California and New Mexico are Mexico. The border moved. In November 2014, many of us are familiar with the immigration reform that Obama passed. Within that series of executive actions, though, he included further militarization of the border that was supported by both parties. Included it. We didn't hear much about that. We didn't hear much that there have been a marriage between the IDF and police departments and border control from Texas to Arizona because like a brigadier for the Israeli offensive forces said, quote, we've learned a lot from Gaza. It's a great laboratory. And they're bringing that laboratory to the border. The US has chosen an Israeli company called Elbit Systems to build a surveillance system on the whole borders of Arizona and Mexico to build integrated fitting towers, which basically means towers for snipers with cameras and radars to detect the movement of Native American crossing and Mexican crossing and numerous other unwanted people. It's going to cost us $145 million. But this isn't the first time. In 2004, the same Israeli company brought drones to the border. Brought drones to the border. And there's another marriage of values between that border and all of Palestine. We're viewed as, quote, permanent outsiders, whether we are Palestinians, Latin Americans, or indigenous populations. By the way, this is going to be built on Native American land, breaking a yet another treaty with the indigenous communities in this country. So we see this marriage, and we know this narrative. The images are being dehumanized. We are less. Our victims are themselves criminals. Our boys are men. How did the cops in this country justify the murder of Tamir Rice? They said he looked like a man. He looked like a 20-year-old. This very young teenager looked like a 20-year-old. That alone served as justification. The New York Times last year said that Palestinian boys, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds, should be classified as men. And when they classify our boys as men, they implicitly allow them to be killed because our men are, by nature, threatening to them. That is racism, just by classifying them as men. And lately, there's been something else that I find to be ridiculously similar to Palestinian liberation. Folks have been rising up and saying, y'all can't say black lives matter. All lives matter. And people seem to missing it. I keep hearing comments about this as if, you know, I can't talk about one disease, I have to talk about all diseases. But that's not it. That's not it. Because the moment they say all lives matter, they're denying the history of brutality, the history of racism, the institutionalized structure. No, black lives matter. Brown lives matter. Because there's a history. And I am reminded whenever we talk about Palestine, that we have to talk about both sides. You know, there's both sides to the story. There's both sides. You know, Hamas also did war crimes against the Israelis last year. And I say, hell no, I will not talk about both sides. I will not talk about the pain that a rapist may be going through when I am still suffering from rape. No, there are no two sides to the story. When we place it that way, we deny the fact that we have an occupier and an occupied. And I will not deny that there's no two sides. And when I saw folks saying all lives matter, it reminded me of that two sides. No, black lives matter and there's one side to the story. 
struggle for liberation. And we both get told the same thing. Slow down. Take your time. Calm down. Why are you in such a rush? Why are you having another protest, another sit-in? Take your time. No. It is the right, ethically and historically, of the oppressed people to choose the means of their liberation. It is their right. It is the right of African American communities in this country and all people of color communities in this country for them to choose the means and for their allies to support them. And it is the right of the Palestinians to defend their land by all means necessary. Which includes armed resistance, just in case I wasn't being clear. There's a man who was murdered 50 years ago this year, one of my favorite men, him and Huey Newton, and he said, if you stick a knife nine inches into my back and pull it out three inches, that's not progress. Even if you pull it out all the way, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound and America hasn't even begun to pull out the knife. They won't even admit the knife is there. So what does it mean? What kind of healing do we need in this country? It's not a decrease of police brutality. It's not don't kill one of us every 28 hours. Could you make it a week? Once a week would be fine. It's not what we're asking. We're not even asking, at least let me make it clear, as an ally to the Black Lives Matter. The demand should not even stop with, black li with police brutality. Just like Ajamu said, the demand goes further into the release of our political prisoners from the mass incarceration system in this country. And it goes further because just like Julian Bond said, another brilliant man, and I quote, violence is black children going to school for 12 years and receiving six years worth of education. So in essence, the demand begins at ending police brutality and ends, if I could say so, with a whole new economic system in this country because capitalism by its nature is built on racism and exploitation. It's built on the concept of disposable lives. We need, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, when we talk about the crimes against people of color in this community, to be talking about reparations against African Americans and against Native Americans. Reparations. And the beauty of this is, when it applies to Palestine, and we're using the instrument of BDS, that we are calling for the end of occupation for all Arab lands, which includes the Golan Heights of Syria, the end of apartheid in all the land of Palestine and the right of return of all Palestinian refugees and their descendants. And human rights for either community, for all communities, is not a buffet that our allies can pick and choose from. We'll support you here, but we don't quite like this. It's asking too much. No, we ask for it all. We ask for it all. And the beauty of this is this level of solidarity. In the midst of the bombardment of Gaza, Palestinians were reaching out to their comrades in St. Louis to tell them how to defend themselves against tear gas. Ferguson with love from Palestine. And in the midst, this is this year, by the way, of the ongoing protest against police brutality, we see this. An African-American man wearing a Palestine t-shirt, sitting next to a Palestinian wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt in a New York City jail cell. We see this. In Gaza, in the West Bank, from Ferguson to Palestine, resistance is not a crime. We see that Zionism is white supremacy, Zionism is racism. We need to dismantle Zionism in all its forms. And we see this, the very statement that Ajamu was talking about. More than 1,000 black activists and artists have issued a beautiful statement of solidarity for full liberation with Palestinians, a statement that contextualizes the struggle. And they cannot dismiss our lives anymore because now we have something that we didn't have years ago. Not only solidarity, but we've got social media, which has been extraordinarily powerful. I remember this quote by D. Ray Mickinson. We did not start this. We have never started any of it. They killed us and they kill us. They created systems to harm us and they create systems to harm us. 
We did not start this. We are fighting to end it. We are and always have been more than our pain. We will win. Thank you.